Hello, I'm Michelle Paver, and we're going out live on Facebook. And uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to be, what am I going to be doing? I'm going to be tackling readers' questions. We've had quite some fantastic ones, actually. I'm going to be talking about two of my favorite books about animals. And the main subject for today is, as you may have guessed from if you've been looking on Facebook, writing about animals, about which I know something. Um, but before we begin, um, just to remind you that if you want to ask any questions or, or make a comment, uh, there are two ways of doing it. You can either go to my website, michellepaper.com, and click on Ask, uh, or you can post a comment here on this video. So let's begin. Uh, readers' questions, first of all. Uh, this is one of my favorite bits. Yeah, first of all, we've got um, a question from Samantha about thin air, which is my most recent ghost story. Um, and I'll just read it out. Uh, Samantha says, I just wanted to reach out about the first page of the novel um, in which there's a line uh, of dialogue where I, I uh, omitted, um, I'm paraphrasing here, um, the adverb after. Um, and just to make it clear in case you haven't read it, the hero is being told that he really should get back indoors because it's a bit cold. And he says, thanks, I shall. Directly, I finish my cigarette. And Samantha's, com Samantha's comment is, well, shouldn't this read, thanks, I shall, directly after I finish my cigarette? Now, Samantha, you're absolutely right in strict grammatical parlance, yes. But I always, when I'm writing dialogue, I try to write dialogue the way people speak it. Um, and they don't speak grammatically. And so if you read those two sentences, thanks, I shall, directly after I finish my cigarette, it's a little bit too correct. Uh, and Stephen, although he's a doctor in 1935, and he's quite posh, he's just traveled halfway across the world, he's a little bit shaken up, and he's not going to be speaking that grammatically. That was my, my take on it. Um, to give another example for people who've read uh, Wolf Brother, there's a bit that actually got corrected about five times by the proofreaders when I was trying to get Wolf Brother edited. And that's a bit when Torak is in huge danger. He's 12 years old. He's just been caught by the Raven clan and he's trying to do a deal with them. And he says, look, if I, if I win the fight or something like that, then, then me and the wolf live. And that kept getting crossed out and corrected as the wolf and I get to live. Um, and so I kept saying to the proofreaders, listen, he's 12 years old. He's not going to be speaking that grammatically. Nobody says, no 12 year old says the wolf and I. So you see what I mean? Dialogue, it's got to be more naturalistic and hence less grammatical. But I'm really glad you asked that question, Samantha, because that brought that up. Um, now, another question, Sonia uh, says, hello, I'm 11. I really like the series of books, The Chronicles of, of Ancient Darkness. Uh, as long as I read only four books out of six, fine. So thank you, Sonia, for reminding me not to have any spoilers in this talk. Um, I really hope that you will read this comment with best wishes from Sonia. P.S. I really like your style of writing. Well, thank you, Sonia, because that's not a comment. That's not a question. It's just a compliment. So thanks very much. Uh, the next question is from Oliver. Uh, I want to do a movie about Wolf Brother. Is it OK? P.S. I love the books. Well, that helps, Oliver. Um, but You'll need to be a little bit careful here. There may be, we may be doing deals with big film studios to make a, a film. Um, I suspect that may be a little bit beyond your budget, live wolves and all that sort of thing. By all means, if you feel like putting together something and posting some pictures on YouTube, do so. Post a link perhaps to my website. We'd be happy to show it. Uh, just don't sell it because then you might get into trouble. Um, but yeah, why why not sort of play around with that on, on YouTube? Um, no news as yet on the film, I have to say. But um, if there is any news of, of, of a film being made of Wolf Brother, you'll hear it on the website. Now for Lorraine, um, is there any advice you could offer a young, inspiring, or I think that means aspiring author to achieve her goal? Or how to get someone something published? My 11-year-old daughter loves your books. Thank you. Uh, it's encouraged her to write her own, and she wishes to become an author. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, well, that's fantastic. I'm thrilled that she likes my books, and it's encouraged her to actually enjoy words and write herself. Um, in terms of writing, uh, tips for, for writers of any age, well, 
one of the most practical is, and it's really the most useful, is keep a notebook with you always. Um, I have one in my bag. I have one by my TV. I have one by my bed. Very important. Just as you're going to sleep, you always get ideas. I'm always switching on the light, uh, scribbling them down. And when I go for a walk on the common, I have a, one in the, my back pocket. Um, because you're going to get ideas as you're walking around or when she's going to school and then write them down, otherwise you'll forget them. Um, another thing, if you're 11, I wouldn't get too fixated on getting published. I know it's it's a nice thing to aim for, but not many 11-year-olds get published. And those that do, if there are any, it's probably not a great idea um, because you haven't yet developed as a writer. And then you might be a sort of one hit wonder, even if you did get there and then you know, you'd fade into the background, you might get discouraged. I think it's a much better idea just to enjoy the writing. You know, your daughter, Lorraine, if Lorraine is the, the 11 year old, um, probably gets a lot of homework and has a lot of on her plate anyway. Just enjoy the writing. Um, but good luck and uh, keep reading the books. Elsa, I guess now this is uh, two here. She's snuck in too. Uh, is there any possibility of another Wolf Brother series? And was any of your work inspired by Jack London, Call of the Wild, etc.? Well, taking the last one first, um, yeah, I'm sure the Call of the Wild, about which I'll be speaking later, did inspire me. I certainly read it and loved it um, as a child. There were other stories as well. I've got one. I mean, I didn't. The thing is, you don't remember when you write a story what you were, what inspired you when you were nine, but. After I'd written Wolf Brother, I looked at uh, a book of stories. I've got it here. It's called Once Long Ago uh, by Roger Lancel and Green. It's stories from all around the world. And I opened it. And this is this is folklore from all around the world. I, it's falling to pieces, so it's going to be a bit awkward. But the first story is called The Boy and the Wolves. I'll hold it up. I don't know if you can see that. There you are. <laughs> the Boy and the Wolves. It's an American Indian story. So, you know... I'd forgotten about that, but obviously it lodged in my subconscious. So yes, um, inspiration comes from all sources. Um, and it's sometimes only after you've written the story that you realize where it came from. I'm not dodging the question about another Wolf Brother series. I think we had that last month, so I'm going to gonna have to get my story straight. But, you know, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago that question, or you'd asked me when I just finished Ghost Hunter, and don't worry, I'm not going to have any spoilers, um, I'd have said, you know, I finished six books. That was always how I'd planned Chronicles of Ancient Darkness to be. And that's it. Um, but I, I, I'm, I've never said never. And I've always said that if I had a good idea, a great idea for um, getting back into Torex world, I'd be happy to, to do that. And... Um, I have been thinking about it. So, you know, it, all I will say is that Torak and Wren and Wolf and Finkedin, they've never really gone away. They've never really left me in the way that sometimes characters do when you finish stories. So I would love to get back if I if I get the right idea. So watch this space. Um, you'll be the first to know on, on Wolf Brother. Uh, sorry, I should say uh, michellepaper.com. <laughs> um, there we go. Now, Colin. Yes, here we go. Hi, Michelle. So far, I've read one of your books, Thin Air. That's my most recent ghost story. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, Colin. Uh, I have Dark Matter. That's the previous ghost story written, uh, set in the Arctic. But I haven't started it yet. You gave me an interest in expeditioning up mountains. Also wanting to get into the British Antarctic Survey team for a while. Inspirational. Uh, need to read all your books one day, but hopefully I won't see any ghosts. Well, thank you very much for that, Colin. Um, I wouldn't rule out the ghosts. If you're going to get anywhere near the British Antarctic Survey or up mountains safely, I hope, and get down them, more to the point, you could have some pretty strange experiences. I certainly have. Um, I haven't. I don't think seen any ghosts, but you know, it's a as part of the appeal of mountains. They are very otherworldly places. Um, so I really hope you get there. Um, and thanks for thanks for commenting, Tanya says, hi, who inspired you to create Ren's character? Um, now, that's that's an interesting one. 
to begin with, I just wanted a strong female character, a companion for Torek. And so um, this is going to sound a bit big headed, but I based her on me a little bit because she's quite feisty and she's quite sharp and critical and she doesn't suffer fools gladly, which is kind of me. Um, and then there are other aspects that aren't me. I mean, I think I'd be lousy with a bow and arrow and she's got a great sense of direction. So that's part of the wish fulfillment that you can do when you're writing. But then she did this thing that some characters do. Other authors will write, talk about this. It's when she came alive. Um, and the best example I can give of that is um, when I was writing the second book, Spirit Walker, and I, I'd planned, I'd done a detailed plan, and I planned her to be in at the beginning and the end of the story. And um, she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't stay at home with the clan while Torek was off in trouble. So I had to completely change the plan to accommodate her because she just wouldn't do what I wanted her to do. I just knew she wouldn't do that. That's what I mean by coming alive. So partly she was inspired by just sort of aspects of me, but then she just became her own person. So that, that probably sounds a bit mysterious, but then writing is... It's quite a mysterious process. Um, yes, now finally, Joanne uh, has a really interesting one. My friend and I just finished Wolf Brother. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Um, we would like a more complete understanding of the Nanwak in the story. We are unclear about what they are and how they came to be made. Well, that's fair enough um, because it's not meant to be clear. Uh, what I can tell you is where I sort of got the idea. Um, this is based on, it's it's an idea that runs through quite a lot of uh, traditional people's beliefs, but I particularly got it from the Inuit. Um, some people used to call them the Eskimos who live up in the Arctic. And the Inuit believe that um, everything has a spirit and is connected. Um, and it's called an Inua, I-N-U-A. And it's kind of like the being inside. That's what it means, I think, although I don't speak Inuit. And even, you know, not only animals and people have this, but also mountains, rivers, streams, trees, forests. And I took that idea and then I wanted to give it a sort of Inuit name. So I changed it around to Nanwak. And that became the world soul. And then I was thinking, um, well, how many souls do people and animals and plants and mountains in my world, Torax world, have? Because in the West, we think we just have one soul if we think we have any souls at all. But, you know, some cultures like ancient Egyptians thought you had about seven different aspects and things. Or was it nine? I forget. So anyway, I worked out that in Torax world, there would be three souls. Every being would have three. There would be the world soul, that is the Nanwak. And then there'd be the name soul, and then there'd be the clan soul. Um, thank you for this question, Joanne, because I actually had to go back to my notes to make sure that, you know, to see if I could find where I got this from. And I'll just show you. This is a page from my actual original notes when I was writing Wolf Brother. Um, I'm not going to show you all of it, but it's sort of just headed souls, I think it is, or something. And it's green because it was green for the forest. All my notes were green for the forest. And, but what you really wanted to ask, what we were trying to ask was not just about the origins of the soul and the world soul in, in Wolf Brother, but these particular three parts of the Nanwak, which are Torak's sort of quest in Wolf Brother. And there, I think there's a bit in, in Wolf Brother where, in fact, yes, I looked it up, where Ren explains this. Um, wait a minute. I did actually find this specially for you. Um, yes, the Nanwak is like a great river that never ends. This is the world soul. Every living thing has a part of it inside them. Hunters, prey, rocks, trees. Sometimes, and this is the answer, sometimes a special part of it forms like foam on a river. When it does, it's incredibly powerful. And that's what Torak has to find. And that's the three parts of the Nanwak that you're asking about. Uh, the answers to the riddle, deepest of all, the drowned sight, oldest of all, the stone bite, coldest of all, the darkest light. Now, I'm not really telling you any more than, than is already in Wolf Brother, and you, I'm sure you've already taken it in. But the reason for that is I don't, there isn't any more explanation. 
these three parts of the nanomic are just the more more sort of powerful bits of the world soul that for some reason have collected in these three strange things that Torak has to find. And no, you're never going to find out who that man was on the ice field who was looking at the, the lamp, which was the third part of the Nanwak. Um, I did consider in later books explaining who he was, but I just think it's, you know, in Torak's world, not everything is going to be explained. In our world, not everything is explained. Um, so I hope that gives you something, but perhaps not as much as, as you were angling for. Well, that's brought me to the end of the, of the questions. Um, but actually, going back to Elsa's question, she, took, she mentioned the call of the wild. Uh, thank you, Elsa, because that leads me very nicely, neatly, to the, the book of the month, um, which, as I mentioned, was books about um, animals. And this is White Fang and indeed The Call of the Wild. It's actually two books by um, Jack London. And I read these when I was a child, uh, and they're amazing. I mean, they were written quite a long time ago, so it's quite sort of formal writing. But Jack London knew what he was talking about. They're, they're both about like, dogs or wolves or part wolves um, having adventures in the wild west, way up north in northern Canada, the Yukon. And this is 100 years ago during the gold rush, and it was very cold, and it was um, very dangerous, lots of wild men as well as wolves. And um, and they're terrific stories, and Jack, Lam Jack London really knew what he was writing about because he'd been up there. And particularly The Call of the Wild, it's an absolute, it's a, it's a classic. He does write from, from the, the dog's point of view or the wolf's point of view in The Call of the Wild. Um, it's it's a, a, an animal who is you know grows up very a pampered, pampered pooch really but then he gradually he gets kidnapped and taken to the wild north of canada and he ends up hearing the call of the wild i'll just read you just a sentence um, it's quite bloodthirsty but it's pretty good um it's from from his point of view and he's running with the pack um and they're running after a rabbit and you know he suddenly experiences bloodlust, the, the urge to hunt for the first time. He was ranging at the head of the pack, running the wild thing down, the living meat, to kill with his own teeth and wash his muzzle to the eyes in warm blood. It's pretty good writing, I think, um, very much from a, a wolf or a dog's point of view. So anyway, that's... That's the book of the month. You get two for the price of one. Um, but that also leads me on to the main topic, um, which is writing about animals. How do you do it? How do I do it? Um, and I think the first thing, yeah, obviously, yes, let, let's start with wolves. <laughs> uh, you choose your animal. Your animal usually chooses you. It's the, the animal you want to write about. In my case, for a long time, it was wolves. I think the way I go about it is, first of all, I find out about the animal. I find out about the wolf. Now, I had actually read lots of books on wolves um, over the years because I'm just interested in them. But it's really important if you're writing from an animal's point of view or about an animal even, you know, how does that animal experience the world? Well, you'll know about wolves, or if any of you have got dogs, you know, they experience them a lot through their noses and they've got terrific hearing but a lot of it's through their nose. And the more you know about the biology of the animal, the more ideas it'll give you. I mean, I didn't just sit down and write Torak meeting wolf without doing a little bit of research. And it struck me, okay, well, wolf is a cub. He's going to, he's going to get completely the wrong idea about Torak uh, because he, he, he can't see terribly well at this stage and he experiences he assesses new things through his nose. So I'll just read you the first bit when, when Wolf meets Torek for the first time. He, that is Wolf, he's a cub, he smelt that it, that's Torek, was male, half-grown, and not one of the pack. But there was something odd about it. It smelt of Wolf, and that's because Torek's wearing his Wolf clan creature skin. It smelt of Wolf, but also of not Wolf. It smelt of reindeer, and red deer, and beaver, and fresh blood, and something else. 
a new smell that he hadn't yet learned. This was very odd. Unless, unless it meant that the not-wolf-wolf wolf was actually a wolf who'd eaten lots of different prey and was now bringing the cubs some food. Well, actually, <laughs> wolf is completely and utterly wrong there because Torek at that time is thinks he's lunch because he's very hungry and he's going to eat wolf. Um, but as we know, um, that doesn't happen. And wolf's mistake of thinking that Torak, because of his clan creature fur, is a wolf, uh, leads him to calling tall Torak tall tailors and to thinking that he's a wolf. Um, hence wolf brother. So knowing about the animal can lead you into all sorts of plot ideas. Obviously, um, that also leads you into to being the animal. And when I was writing Wolf Brother, that the more I knew about wolves, the easier it became to just imagine each next step of Wolf's journey. And just as I said that um, Ren's character became real and sort of changed the plot, Wolf did that practically every time I was writing about him. Um, one particular example, and don't worry, I won't involve spoilers, but in book five, you know, if you start thinking like a wolf, you realize there are some things he just wouldn't do. Some things animals wouldn't do, but people do, because we can be sometimes less logical than animals. Um, there was a bit when I had Wolf tracking one of the soul eaters, Thiazzi. Now, Wolf had had a hard time with Thiazzi in book three. Um, so I thought maybe, oh, he was going to attack this, this baddie, Thiazzi. But then I realized that's not what wolves do. That's not what animals do. They don't go for revenge because revenge is pointless. They attack if they're threatened uh, or if they want to eat something. And actually that was a really useful realization. I've been thinking like wolf and that made me think, oh, wait a minute. He doesn't take revenge. Therefore, he won't understand what Torak's about when he's seeking revenge all the way through book five. So, you know, thinking like your animal can really help give you ideas for the story. And it's really fun as well. It makes you feel like you're spirit walking. Um, obviously, if you can, meeting your chosen animal can be really helpful. Sit watching videos on, on YouTube or on TV, that can also help. Meeting them, there's no substitute for it, really. Uh, but it's not always possible. It may not always be safe. Obviously, I've met wolves many times at the UK Wolf Conservation Trust, um, where they named one of the wolves in, in Torak's honor. He's my favorite wolf, of course. But just touching an animal, smelling them, um, it's, it usually gives you surprises. I mean, for example, yeah, here's my bag of wolf fur. <laughs> Don't worry, no wolf was harmed in getting this fur. Um, it was literally just the under fur that in the summer you can sort of, if you know your wolf careful and are polite, um, you can sort of pull out tufts of it. And it smells, oh, it smells lovely. It takes me right back to Torak, Torak the wolf that is. It's brilliant. Because no fur is all the same. Um, this is a bit of, this is a reindeer hide um, mitten from the Arctic. And this reindeer fur is nice and smooth. But if I grab a piece of, I'm going to do this. Yep, there we go. Seal hide. That's not an endangered seal, by the way. It's, it's, uh, there are loads of these things in the Arctic. But it's sort of bristly and silvery. So, you know, the closer you could get to your animal, um, the more useful it will be. But the other thing about doing that kind of hands-on research, if you can, yes, seal hide, thank you, uh, is that you get unexpected things that may not have anything to do with what you, with that particular animal that you're writing about. And this happened to me when I was researching book two of, of Chronicles, which was, and I was swimming with wild killer whales in North Norway. And... Um, I was in a sort of wetsuit, or dry suit rather, to keep me warm because it was November and it was pretty cold out there. And they were swimming and I was floating, you know, I was, it was like a Michelin man, you know, I couldn't actually get under the water, but I sort of had my head down with a snorkel and goggles. And I was in their world 
and I could, it was just beautiful green light. That's what the sea felt like. And I was all warm and sort of floating around and weightless. And it was fantastic. And I could hear them sort of whistling and clicking in the background. And one of them swam directly underneath me, which was very dramatic. So I got lots about killer whales. But this beautiful green light uh, and being what it, the, what it felt like to be a whale or a seal really stayed with me. And that gave me the whole idea for when Tarak spirit walks for the first time and he thinks he's a seal. Um, and I wasn't expecting to get that from my research about killer whales. So, you know, you, as, a, as a writer, you've got to be sort of opportunistic. And if something grabs your attention, yep, you'll go for it. And you can use it and write it down in your notebook and it'll come in useful if something really strikes you. So, uh, yeah. I could go on and on about this, and um, sorry if I have gone on, but if anyone, if what I've said sparks further questions, I don't think this is the, the last time I'll be talking about writing about animals, because I haven't even touched on lions and falcons um, and dolphins, which were the subject of gods and warriors, but it's endlessly fascinating because they all have different characters, uh, and each individual animal is different. Every wolf is different from every other wolf. So um, I haven't finished with writing from animals' points of view, I think. Uh, and good luck to any of you who, who, who are trying it. It's endlessly fun. Well, I think that's all we've got time for right now. Um, but thanks very much for all your questions. They really were fantastic. They've taken me back down memory lane and, and made me, sent me scurrying back to look at my notes. And um, keep them coming. Uh, and just to remind you to ask questions, you know, they'll be collected up for, for next month's Michelle Live. Uh, and I'm looking forward to answering those. And next month, um, the subject, I think, will be writing about ghosts. So there we go. There you have it. And uh, join me next month. And thanks for, thanks for listening. Okay, bye.